Kingston Town can't win. Burton Crusher and our Waverley Star, straight for straight. Cometh the hour, cometh the legend, Weeks has done it. We're joined today by Lizzie Jelfs, our 2022 Ladbrokes Cox Plate Carnival Ambassador. Lizzie, welcome, and um, to be announced as a Cox Plate Carnival Ambassador, how excited are you? Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I'm really excited. It's been a race that I've been very connected to ever since I moved out from the UK, and not only that, it's such an iconic race within the racing calendar here in Australia, and it's so well known overseas as well. So it's I feel it's a very good fit for me, being a purist and being someone who's very much uh, connected from not only the media perspective, but also from working in the stables and working with horses that have contested a cox plate. And I know how difficult it is not only to get them in, but to win the race. Um, I'm super proud to be an ambassador because it's, um, yeah, it's just such a wonderful race. Well, it's great to have you on board. And first year we've had crowds back for three years through COVID. Um, we're past that now. and We're expecting a sellout crowd here on Ladbrokes Cox Plate Day and a big crowd here on uh, Manicato Stakes Night. How excited are you to have crowds back on course? Yeah, well, if the Moyer is anything to go by, I think we're going to have a really big crowd and it was such a great atmosphere, Moyer Stakes Night. And I've noticed that the crowds are really embracing sporting events, not only racing events, but you've seen you know, packed capacity crowds at the AFL and the NRL and you're able to see that people are really not taking these iconic events for granted. They're getting to the races and enjoying the spectacle, which is the horses, you know, the fashion, having a punt, whichever one that you enjoy or all three of them. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing a big crowd. Obviously it's a a capped crowd, but it will be absolutely pumping. And um, it always is. Every Cox Plate that I've ever been to, I've never been able to, if if I'm a, someone who's at the races participating or whether I'm part of the public, you've never been able to get a, you know, a spot or a seat, but you've always been able to enjoy the spectacle. So very much looking forward to the day and um, yeah, the whole weekend really, it's just 24 hours of amazing racing. So yeah, we'll touch on the Cox Plate a little bit more later, but just in terms of horse racing, at what age did it start for you? You were obviously born into it? No, I'm not born into racing. I'm actually, have no racing connection at all I am just a girl who loved horses and was really invested in uh, being around horses ever since I I think I rode a horse when I was about five or maybe I was put on at about four when I went to a show um, a fate in England and my nanny at the time put me on a horse and and I remember being like loving it and just pestering my parents like please can you take me for riding lessons and they were like okay so they took me for riding lessons and I I just every riding lesson I had I just tried to keep getting more and more and more out of them so I, I just absolutely loved it and it was nothing else I really wanted to do as a kid and that sort of transcended into my teen and my you know younger tween years and teenage years because I ended up getting a pony and I did pony club and you know my parents really didn't my dad's had horses when he was young but my mum hadn't but they really learned along the way like I did and when it came to time to sort of, you know, whether I headed off to university or what I was going to do, I I didn't quite know. So I thought I have a year out and I come to Australia. And that's when I started working in racing prior to coming out here. And I used what I learned in the UK in racing to travel. That was the main main objective and um, headed out down under. And that was my, my first real foray into racing was when I finished school and when I started out here. When you got out here, you ended. Um, you started with the Hayes team, working for the Hayes team, and were there for quite a while. Um, what was it like working for the, the Hayes team um, and your time there, and what you learnt? Yeah, it, it, amazing ground for a lot of trainers that are now training, and for me, it was amazing grounding because you're working with really talented people within the organisation, and then you're also working with really nice horses as well, and horses that have got every opportunity to run at their you know their capacity and it was a great learning curve I got to work alongside Tony McAvoy initially Uh, Gary Fennessy was another uh, person who was really integral in sort of my working life there and everything that I know today and then David Hayes of course when he came back from Hong Kong he was very hands-on and I worked extremely closely with him so my time there was amazing it's like the school you can't pay for that sort of education like you're learning every single day you never stop learning if you think you've learnt, you're 
you know, there's it's time to give it away because you're never, there's always something different that you're going to learn uh, at the stables. And the way that I look at it is it was like a, it was like a, a, a school for me to go to that I was getting paid to do. So I'm learning every time and, and getting great experiences and travelling all around the world. And I would describe it as, yeah, some of the best years of my life. And the mighty Foo, he was obviously one of the great uh, Ladbrokes Cox played horses. Was he your favourite? He was, yeah, look, he was, he gave me probably the biggest thrills. Um, it's hard to pinpoint which one your favourite is. Like, that's like picking your kids. <laughs> like, they all have got something special about them. He was really special because I, I when I look back in hindsight, like, I didn't really know a lot about racing and I didn't know a lot about what I was actually doing, but I was, su- I was very light at the time and they want, he'd had an injury, so they wanted me to ride him work. And I was just, you know, you go off what times you run, so it might have been go five evens or go five and two. So five evens would be you go five furlongs, and for the first three furlongs, you would go 14 seconds a furlong. And if you were running home, that's five home two, so you'd run, you'd improve each time, or you'd stay those 14 seconds a furlong each and every one. So I was going, working to time, I had a beeper and got used to it, and he just used to look after me, like he was an old gentleman, even though he wasn't that old, he was just an old gentleman, and I just think that he, um, in hindsight, I look back and I think what an absolute gentleman he was of a horse, and how he looked after this complete newbie, and he was managed to win a cox plate off of me, not knowing, you know, what I was doing, so I I think he would be, he holds a very special pace in my heart, I, re- I remember being in that grandstand, in amongst a sea of pink and Lonro fans with, you know, the name being spelt out, and when he came around the top of the straight, and he, uh, he surged to the line, and I saw him change legs under Stephen King, and I thought, we're actually going to win this, and like, I didn't know how big it was, I the cox plate seemed big, but I didn't know how big it was. And, yeah, that was probably the greatest racing feeling I've ever had. Lunro down the outside. Fields of Omar and Neck in front. Defire trying to get him from Lunro. Fields of Omar and Defire. Fields of Omar the inside. He's hanging on. Fields of Omar. You've done it. Yes, Fields of Omar, he's done it. So one of your main jobs now is obviously in the mounting yard. You're a mounting yard analyst. What are some of the things you look for in a horse in terms of whether it's bone structure, muscle, um, breeding, yeah, those types of things? I I think it's really simple what I look for. I look for a a good type, a good physical type, so a horse that I think is structurally built the best way for racing. I look for fitness and I look for a happy horse as well. And a lot of the time with the bigger stables, you're seeing – a lot of those horses presented in the yard so then that's when you have to get a little bit more picky and you build a profile on them and you understand how much improvement they've made from one run to the next and that's some horses are say say a horse goes out at two dollars for a race but he's at his third run in his preparation and there's a horse at five dollars and I know he was he was underdone first up and he's made loads of improvement and they're going to get the same run in the race well I'm probably going to take a gamble on the $5 horse because he's a better price and he's on an upward curve and this horse has stayed the same. So that is that is how I found I had a little bit of an edge because I've been looking at horses for well my whole life and that is something that has come naturally. So you build up a profile. If you're just going to look at them for the first time, those few things that I said are really important, just a nice type horse that's fit and got a great coat and happy and relaxed they're the basic elements but if you're really serious about it you're building profiles on each and every horse and that's how you have an edge and you become successful at it so what does your black book look like and imagine there's copious amounts of data in there um how do you store it all how do you keep it all what's your kind of method uh, methodology so i keep it um in excel and just go through each each horse will you just put I put them all in and then I will just put a mark next to their name and I've got a quite a good memory when it comes to horses which is really weird because I don't have a good memory <laughs> anywhere else it's all yeah if I look at horses like I horses like certain ones will stand out and sometimes I I don't even like I look at it but I'm I've already thought about it anyway because I'm like that's one to watch for two weeks time wherever it goes and a good a good um 
thing that I do when I was constantly doing the yard. It's a little bit different now, but I'm getting back into it again. I've had a bit of a break since I joined Seven, but I'm getting back into the yard back in Sydney. And one thing that I do do is on every race meeting you have, you go through. So you, you don't just go through the sectionals that have been posted. I sometimes clock races as well and just see if they're what I thought they were. I'd make sure that I look at trials time and time again and that will all go into the data and to notes and it yeah it's it and photos I've got a lot of photos um on certain horses so yeah it's it's a I love it though it's a you correlate a lot of data but it's by doing those job by doing it it goes straight in and that's what you'll find if you're writing it down and you're doing the work you get the results absolutely and how, is it hard to juggle, obviously, the market with the mounting yard sometimes? Like, you might like a horse that's 100 to 1, looks really good in the yard, but do you ever kick yourself when you, you think you found one at a big price but you don't tip it? Like, well, you obviously know that people are yeah. following your tips. So I I actually don't look at the market. Like, I wouldn't – when you're – people often ask me about the market, and when you're doing the yard, you – have got no idea what the market is doing. Like you're talking, think about it, you're talking the whole time. So it's not it's not like me to be programmed to even go and have a look at the market. Even even when I'm doing my form, I wouldn't even bother. Like I won't. I don't. There's no point for me to do it. Like I'm doing. I've, I'm doing it on looks. And the one thing I do do is I look at a speed map because you. That's a. I feel like that's a good indication of how you know two horses could look really good, but if one's going to get a better run, well, which one's going to win? So I do look at a speed map, but a market is irrelevant to me. When you've done the yard, they ask you for your pick pretty much straight away. So you don't have time to know if something's firmed or if anything's drifted. Like you just have to, the market is, for me, irrelevant. But what is definitely annoying is, say, if I like two horses and I don't know their price and I'm, say, one's $14 and I think it's $5 and this one is $5, you know. So I've got two at, like, you know, I think they're the same price. And like, I should have gone with that one that was bigger price because they look the same and then that one wins. You know, like that's the only time I get frustrated. But as far as it making my decision any easier, well, it doesn't, I don't, I don't even use it. Your great friend Annabelle Neesham has three, maybe four life chances in this year's Ladbrokes Cox Plate. That's a pretty remarkable um, achievement and effort from a, any trainer, but let alone a reasonably new trainer. Uh can you tell us a bit about your relationship with Annabelle? Yeah, so proud of her. She's done an amazing job. Um, she was given some good horses, but she's also gone out and purchased her own horses and has made her own path. And she is doing a remarkable job, especially with the tried horses. She's done so well with them. She is a incredibly driven and talented woman. She's got so much you know, innate knowledge about horses. And she's also not from a racing family. She's just from a horsey background, but she's got so much innate knowledge about horses and how they're prepared. And from her background of being in eventing, she's really focuses on their actions and how they present. And she's very, very hands-on. So it's no surprise when I first met her, I could, I just felt there was so much, I just like, I, I loved what she was doing. She was working for Kieran and Dave at the time. And I was like, She's really smart. And, yeah, when she went out to train on her own, I was like, wow, she's really brave. Because <laughs> she doesn't, you know, she's super brave. And I was like, I, I wish I had done that. Sort of part of me wished I did that. But, yeah, she's she's a very clever lady and it doesn't surprise me whatsoever. And they have a mighty chance. Um, I don't know about the international horse. I haven't seen him yet. But I was at the beach on Sunday. I rode Mawanga. And Raf, who is her regular track rider for Zaki, was out at the beach as well. And Liz Laycock, who's down with the horses. And, yeah, I said – I was walking out on Zaki, um, Moanga and I said, oh, my goodness, this horse looks incredible. And then I looked over at Zaki and I was like, he looks pretty good too. <laughs> so, yeah, it's – she's done a great job and, yeah, bring on the race. It's I'm so excited. So the Cox Plate in general, what are your thoughts around the race? And obviously – being from overseas, what were your thoughts beforehand and how has it changed since, you, since you've come to Australia? Well, I think it's developed a lot over the years, hasn't it? It's become quite an international targeted race and you often, well, it's been won by internationals 
uh, a few times. So it's it's quite a it's a race where I think it's at that sort of sweet spot where sometimes when we go further from 2000 meters we become a bit vulnerable whereas I think at the 2000 meters and obviously you know below the 2000 meters I think we're really competitive and that's what makes it such a great race and we saw last year uh, how tight it was and I'm sure you know James Cummings is you know looking for a bit of um, you know a bit of uh, divine retribution with Animo but it's just such a it's such a unique race like it's a, a unique course some horses who aren't weight for age horses elsewhere are weight for age horses at Mooney Valley like Fu like he was a good weight for age horse but he was a real like he went to another level here so it's a horses for courses but if you're a good horse you can get around here and you can run really really well so I think it has developed over the years to become not only iconic in Australia but also very much on the international scene and, and that's what you want isn't it you want the best of the best racing against each other. Absolutely, and, and you talked about Fu being one of your greatest or best Cox Plate memories. Any other key ones that stand out for you um, in the history of the race? I think Winx's third Cox Plate it was. You're going to laugh at me with this one. Was when I actually thought, okay, she's she's a real champion. Like I, I I thought she was always very very good, but when she won the third one, I was just like, she is. Like, next level. Am I ever going to see anything like her again? And when she won the fourth one, I just expected her to win that. Mm. But I just think the third one was, like, she really had to dig deep. You know, she really had to win win with authority. And, um, yeah, I, I think that was be my most memorable. But, yeah, the fourth Cox Plate for Winx was, you know, and everything afterwards. I remember watching Bruce McAvaney, who I work with now, uh, interviewing Chris Waller and just the... And Chris gets quite emotional, just the relief that she's able to surpass champions and she's etched. I mean, are we, I ask you guys, are we ever going to see another one like her? I mean, well, I know that it's been said around the office that, uh, so Michael Brow, our chief executive, um, with Black Caviar, I think he actually got in front of all staff and said, Embrace this night tonight when she came out here. Um, you'll never see this again. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, lo and behold, a few yeah. years later, um, the mighty mayor turned up. So, we hope, definitely hope that there is another one in, in the works because we saw how much it does for, for us and just and for racing in general. So, yeah. But as I said, I, I can't see anyone ever being as good as she was. Yeah, we have so much to thank her for. Like she really put racing on the front page for all the good reasons and I often would see like the young kids watching her over the fence and I'm like they will remember that day for the rest of their lives and they could be you know sitting like we are talking about it in you know 10 years time so that's what we owe her for and and she did it here on this hello turf absolutely so we've got two non-racing questions to finish we've got uh fashion and racing they obviously go hand in hand something I know you wanted to ask (laughs) (laughs) I've been waiting to ask this one Steffi dresser (laughs) Um, no, it's definitely the girls in the office <laughs> made us ask these. What uh, tips do you have for the punters heading to the races this spring and how do they survive the long day? Oh, um, pack a, pack a um, pair of flat shoes in your bag. That's <laughs> what I always think is a good one to do for the ladies if you've got heels on all day. Um, but I think, yeah, just enjoy the day. Don't, don't over-race. <laughs> Get your bets on early and um, that's how you survive. But fashion-wise... Well, it can be a bit hit and miss the weather springtime, so I always like to wear something that you know you're not going to get too cold. And I mean, I love it. I my my race day fashion is I like to be look you know very chic. Like I like to be smart, and it's you know I'm a bit more less is less skin. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it's nice to have always invest. My my number one is invest in a really good suit. For spring, that's always a a big one. You can dress it up, dress it down, and some like cool millinery and hats, change it up, and hair and makeup. Go and you know splash out and get someone fabulous to do your hair and makeup is always um, it's always my go to advice (laughs) because I'm hopeless at it. (laughs) (laughs) And the um, the big question of the day, and you you briefly touched on it, hat or fascinator? It's something we always wrestle with. Yeah, I am a because of TV, I have to wear smaller and. Uh, fascinators but there are some I think a fascinator is beautiful but if you're 
if you're going for the big hat, there is a bit of you've got a bit of management to go with it. So if you're if you don't want to kiss anyone, go with the big hat because then you don't have to <laughs> greet anyone. But I reckon a small little pillbox or something really chic. There's some beautiful millinery, like not even expensive, but like definitely the homegrown Australian millinery is who I tend to go towards. And you can go really high end like an Erida Winter, or you can you know go to Ford Millinery and, and pop a headband on that looks just as good. So there's so many people out there to you know, embrace and there's lovely little crowns and bits and pieces. You're learning so much about this, aren't you, boys? <laughs> the girls will be hanging on to that, yeah. that for sure. Yeah, but a good suit, a nice tailored outfit that you can change it up is always, I mean, you would, you know what a good suit is, boys. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you can change it, that's it. Right? And absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah, so the weather can be a bit hit and miss, so I, I reckon a suit this year. There's so, there's so many beautiful ones out there. And we can't let you go without a tip for the, you know, we'll go with maybe the two races. So the Ladbrokes Manicato Stakes on the Friday. I know that's probably a little bit more up in the air than the Cox Plate, but a tip for the Manicato Stakes and the Ladbrokes Cox Plate? Yeah, so I reckon after Rothfire's run in the Moyer, he looks, you know, he's he's the one that is the obvious horse to go towards a, man, a Manicato. It's re- in the Cox Plate, when does this podcast go out? Don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a big race this weekend. Yeah. there's a big, it, yeah, there's a big race this weekend. But you know what? If I'm saying here and now, what I'm saying is the barriers are so important in the Cox Plate, and it's going to be so so many tactics. You go with Animo, who has done absolutely nothing wrong, and the, oh, my only question mark with him is that he has that niggling little mm. injury after his his win in the George Main. And you'll never know exactly how he's going until he's put under pressure, even though they're really happy with him. And he may be fine, but that's just a, that just adds to the theatre, doesn't it? Hopefully he's fine. And then you've got Zaki, who's on an upward curve. I thought it was a good run the other day. He will definitely improve out of the run. Moanga was huge. huge and the 2,000 metres will be just everything that he wants. And then Alligator Blood. I think card. is yeah the the wild card, and then now we've had top rank, and he could beat them all. So, I think this year it would be very fitting to see another female trainer win the race. Gay has never won it, so that's one of the big majors that she's never won. So she would be absolutely desperate to win the race. Has been won the Cox Plate by two females before, but it's never been won by a female jockey. And it's never been won by a female trainer and jockey combination, which would be Annabelle and Jamie Carr with Zaki. Zaki. So I think we need a really good fairy tale. But then again, it would be lovely to see another Cummings win the race. It's a few good storylines. So there's some amazing (laughs) storylines. And I think that you're going to see a a great race coming up soon this weekend. And um, or if this is playing, it will be passed. But yeah, it's it's a. It's shaping up to be what I thought it would, a great, great race. Oh, awesome. I think that's all we've got time for. Lizzie, thank you for your time. Thanks, Lizzie. And, uh, thank you so good much. Good luck with the carnival. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very for much. having me.